Bibles to the book of 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and my message is entitled, The Terror of the Lord. Fun, huh? The Terror of the Lord. Now, beloved, this is part one of a two-part message that I'm going to preach to you. And it will be a very sober and serious, albeit a necessary message. So I want you to pay close attention to it because it affects every person's soul personally. Now, beloved, listen to me. I believe, beyond a shadow of a doubt, God wants me to preach this message for two reasons. Number one, because when I left here last week, I went home, took a shower, sat down, started reading, and God gave me a message for this coming Sabbath. I had a perfect outline. I said, praise the Lord, I'm all set to roll, you know. And then God started dealing with me. He said, Joel, that's not what I want you to preach this week. I gave you an outline, but I didn't say to preach it this week. And so he gave me this message, the terror of the Lord. Now, I know the Spirit of God wanted me to preach it. I also know that Satan does not want me to preach it. Let me tell you why. Because uh, then my back goes out, and I've been suffering with it all week. And then my eczema is bad, and you see I couldn't shave my mustache and the rest of me. I said, you've got to be kidding me. Uh, but, but, beloved, listen to me. The reason this is so important that I preach to you, it's an unpopular message. Nevertheless, it is a timely message. Is because of the non-committal faith of many in the church of Jesus Christ today. It's here to you, apply it to yourself. You folks watching by television, apply it to yourself. It is imperative. This has everything to do with your eternal standing before the Lord. Amen? So let's stand up, please, for the reading of God's Word. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And I'm going to read verses 9 through 11. Now, beloved, next week, I'm going to give you a perfect outline of this message. Part 2. I'm going to exegete everything for you. This week, I have to lay the foundation for you. So I want you to bear with me. Uh, you don't have to worry about taking too many notes today. Next week, you'll be able to do it. I want to be able to preach to you today, and I want you to hear what I have to say. Okay? So 2 Corinthians chapter 5, beginning with verse number 9. Paul says, wherefore we labor, that whether present, that is in our body while we're still alive, or absent, out of our body, that's what he's been talking about, the resurrection body, we may be, now notice this, accepted of him. We may be accepted of him, well-pleasing to him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body, according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord, that's where I get my title from, we persuade men. Now, Paul just didn't think of salvation casually, did he? He says, we persuade men, but we are made manifest unto God, and I trust also are made manifest in your conscience. The terror of the Lord. Let's go before the throne of grace, and beloved, as we do, I want you to just say to yourself this morning, I'm going to empty myself. I just want to hear what pastor has to say as he preaches the word of God and let the spirit of God minister to me. Is that fair enough? All right, beloved. Uh, and I, there's nothing new that I'm going to tell you. There's nothing new anyways, right? But hopefully God will anoint this for you. And if it applies to you, fine. If not, at least you know it and you can preach it to other people. Amen. Heavenly Father, I pray that the church triumphant in heaven, the holy apostles and prophets, the holy women of God would join our prayer. And Lord, you'd anoint this preacher with feet of clay. Speak to me, in me, with me, through me, Lord God. And minister to your people, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, let me give you a little background on what's going on here. Paul had founded the church at Corinth in Greece on his second missionary tour, and he did it around 55 AD. Now, Corinth was a very learned and center in the ancient world, but it was also a very wealthy and a decadent and debauched city. It was a city wholly given over to idolatry. If you went into Corinth, you would see statues everywhere. There would be fornication, cult fornication before these statues. It was filled with immorality and sins of the flesh, just like most cities of the world today, right? But it was filled, beloved, with united evil and wickedness. Every wickedness imaginable was practiced there by its people. 
And you see, beloved, nevertheless, when Paul preached the gospel there, many people heard the gospel and they repented. Hallelujah. Amen. And they were marvelously converted, saved and sanctified before the Lord. Now, God forgave them, supernaturally and radically changed them and cleaned up their lives from the inside out. And they began to start living holy, righteous and godly lives. In other words, now these former people and pagans became Christians. Now these former idolaters and adulterers became the saints of God. And all through this epistle, you see Paul warning them about their idolatry and their immorality. But now they're saints of God, amen? And now these, they be, these fornicators, the Bible says they had gotten indulged in fornication and homosexuality, but now they had become the disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ, beloved. Now they had become these former drunks and liars and thieves and extortioners. The Bible said, through the power of the gospel, they had become the servants of the Lord. Would you say amen? That's why the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5, 17 of this same chapter, therefore if any man be in Christ, he is a what? New creature, new creation. All things have passed away, and behold, all things have become new. Now, beloved, <clears throat> excuse me, Paul spent about 18 months, that's a year and a half, personally teaching the Corinthians the cardinal doctrines of the Christian faith. I can't tell you how important it is to learn that. I can't tell you, ladies and gentlemen. You see, this church was once a red on fire church for Christ and they had lived a holy and a righteous and a godly life of it. But then as we read the epistles we see something happened. Now there was four epistles Paul wrote to the church at uh, Corinth. The first epistle we lost it. The second one we call 1 Corinthians. The third epistle we lost it. It was a straight rebuke. And we know that from the church fathers. The fourth epistle is now the second epistle. So I guess God didn't want us to hear it. But something happened of an after Paul had left Corinth. Moral and spiritual apathy and apostasy started creeping in the church. How did it happen, Pastor? Because false teachers and false preachers crept into the church just like they do today. And they began to teach the Christians there the heretical Gnostic doctrine of antinomianism. Anti meaning against nomos, meaning God's law. They were preaching out against God's law. In other words, beloved, they were saying that now that you've been saved by the grace of God, you don't have to obey God's law anymore. They were saying that no matter what sins you committed after you got saved, you could never fall from grace, never lose your salvation. The worst that you could happen is you would lose your rewards. Have you ever heard that? You see, beloved, these false teachers were teaching that they were supposedly eternal secure through their one-time act of faith in God. But this was a bold-faced lie that came right out of the pit of hell, and it even smelled like smoke. You see, folks, it was an outright dangerous and deadly heresy and deception that could have cost people their soul, and it's costing many their soul in the Christ, uh, Church of Christ today. However, some of the Church of Corinth, they embraced this heresy. It was easy. You mean I don't have to give up anything? I don't have to deny anything? I can just do what I want? Yeah. And then people saying that, you know, you should really follow the Lord, but if you don't, don't worry about it. So a lot of people in the church of Corinth started believing this heresy, beloved, and uh, of what we know today, not only is antinomianism, it's probably better known as ultra-gracism. Have you ever heard that term? Ultra-gracism. And unfortunately, the ominous consequences of it were devastating. Just read the epistles. You will see, beloved, as you begin to read the epistles, that many began to compromise. Many began to backslide from the faith. Many began to grow lukewarm in their commitment to the Lord. Lord, And many began to apostatize from the faith altogether and go back and practice the former sins that would now once again jeopardize their soul and their salvation before the Lord. But you know the worst part is, beloved, they were totally oblivious to that because they had forgotten what Paul had taught them and they started believing the false teachers and preachers and started reading their Bibles. Ah, this seems easy. Dr. So-and-so teaches that and I saw that church and they say about Jesus or whatever. Beloved, that means nothing, does it? Does what a preacher says measure up to the infallible Word of God? That's what it comes down to. What? saith the scripture. Come on and say amen out there. What saith the scripture? You see, beloved, it's like many are doing in the church today. Amen. That's why Paul 
when you read this epistle in Second in, in Second uh, Corinthians chapter thirteen verse five, he told the people there at the church. Now these are Christians. He says, "Examine yourselves to see whether you're in the faith, if you ever were in the faith, or if you still are in this one." true apostolic faith of the Lord Jesus Christ. Examine yourself, and I challenge everybody, especially those watching my television, who write me all the time, who call me all the time, who tell me they want to hear the preaching, but they don't want to come to church, and they don't want to sell out to the Lord. So you listen to me now. You're writing, you want it, I'm giving it to you. You see, beloved, Paul wrote two stinging epistles to warn, rebuke, and correct these kind of Christians and exhort them, not only to repent, but now return to the Lord and the truth of the Word of God before it was too late. And he warned them to flee from the wrath to come, and though they did those things, would not enter into the kingdom of God. And they were already in the kingdom, but they would have been booted out of it. But listen to me, if you can imagine you join a Patriots team, you say, I want to play, you join the team, but you don't want to show up for practice. You don't want to exert yourself on the field. You can't make the team. You can't make the position. You're not showing up. What do you do? Say, okay, I'm going to hire you for $2 million a year? Or do you boot them off the team? What do you do? How is it then, beloved, when the king of kings and lord of lords says, look, you came into my kingdom now. I'm the king of the kingdom. You're the subject. And you must learn the laws of the kingdom and live accordingly. What's the difference, beloved? People try to make like a difference. Well, God's different than that. Listen, God's different than man for sure, but God's not different than his word. And that's exactly what the word of God has to teach here. He said, beloved, throughout his two epistles, Paul again and again used this refrain. Listen to what he said. He said, know ye not, know ye not, know ye not. In other words, beloved, what he's saying is, know ye not, your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God. 1 Corinthians 6, uh, 19 and 20, I won't quote the rest of it for you. He says, know ye not that those who do such things shall not inherit inherit the kingdom of God? What's he talking to? He's talking to Christians. Know ye not you are in the faith except ye be reprobates? Know ye not? Now, beloved, over and over again, Paul uses that phrase, know ye not, to denote utter amazement at their profound ignorance and illiteracy of the most basic truths of the Christian faith especially after he had sent, spent so much time there teaching them. Beloved, I, I, believe me, I'm not saying this to me, but I want you to, it takes a lot to preach. And I'm an older man right now, and it takes everything I have, especially the way I feel right today, to give you what, and you sp- you're willing to be spent for the Lord and for the people of God. And then to have people, after you've talked to them and trained them and trained them, just turn around and walk away. You can't buy your time back on this earth. Did you waste your time? You know, I've told uh, Brother Kenny, he's a carpenter, I told my son-in-law who's a mason, at the end of the day when they build something, they can step back and have a sense of satisfaction, amen? Boy, look at that good work today. You try that as a minister. Bearing with people over and over and over and teaching them and reteaching them and reteaching them. And beloved, I'll tell you, it, it's weary. It's weary of the flesh. You believe me now? And you're spent. I, I have a hard time now, really, honestly, leading all the singing and the preaching again because it takes so much out of you. You lose so much fluid out of your lungs, and I'll go home and drink seven glasses of water today, and my wife will tell you how big those glasses are, just to try to replenish my fluids. So it takes a lot out of you, beloved. Amazed at their ignorances, at ignorance and their illiteracy of the most basic doctrines of the Christian faith that he had spent so much time teaching them. Boy, I could speak for every preacher in this world saying that, beloved. Because it sounds like many carnal Christians today, doesn't it? You see, beloved, we can't live the way we want to live and still go into the kingdom of heaven, despite what people are saying to you. We must live according to the way God commands us in his word to go to heaven. We cannot live according to the way we feel, beloved, is right, but according to what God has revealed is right in his word and now commands us to do. Remember, Christ is the king. You're the subject in the kingdom. Amen? In John 14, 15, a familiar passage of Scripture, Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. He did not say, if you love me, ignore my commandments. 
Jesus did not say, ladies and gentlemen, if you love me, break my commandments. Jesus didn't say, if you love me, disobey or make up your own commandments like many are doing today in the body of Christ, and ultimately they will be lost in the end. And I don't say that for out of satisfaction. I'm trying to bring the church back to the truth of the Word of God. When I say the church, the church, it's an editorial church. Church everywhere, here and everywhere. You see, beloved, so Paul here has to remind them of a basic, basic truth. And he does that, beloved, because there is a self serving and preserving reason for it. You say to me, Pastor Joel, what are you saying? I'm saying this, beloved, we are not, as the choir sang about today, to be morally and spiritually ignorant uh, uh, and passive of what the faith requires that we're supposed to do, lest we fall into sin, live in sin, not even know that we're in it, and then ultimately be judged and damned in the end. So what was that truth that Paul tried to bring them back to? That's a good question, isn't it? Well, look at verses 10 and 11. For we must all, how many? Notice the all-inclusiveness here. Every man, every woman, every child, all who have ever lived, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, the Bema seat, that everyone may receive the things done in his body. Done where? Done in your body. Oh, my soul loves the Lord, but my body doesn't. See, I've got my own thing. Done in his body, according to that he had done, whether he be good or bad. Paul says, knowing therefore, knowing this therefore, the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Now the word terror there is the Greek word phobos, ladies and gentlemen, from which we get our English word phobia or real fright from. Literally it means to be stricken and smitten in your heart, in your soul, with fear of God, awe of God, dread of God, beloved. And this word is a two-sided coin. You know, there's the Indian head on one side and the buffalo on the other. That's my generation. If you got one, it might be worth more than a nickel to you too, right? But on the one side, beloved, it means this. For those who love the Lord, know the Lord, have faith in the Lord, who are walking with the Lord, it means to have deep reverence respect for his divine person and his divine power as the Lord, as the sovereign and supreme almighty being and God of the universe, beloved, who has forgiven us in Christ and reconciled us unto himself. Amen? So we have that kind of fear. Those of us who know the Lord, love the Lord, walking with the Lord, we have deep reverence and respect for God. That's the one side of the coin. But see, that's, a, that's the only side that people want to preach today. You can't split that word in half. Conversely, beloved, the other side of the coin, it means to shake and quake with great fear, great dread, great trembling at his divine wrath and his punitive and terrifying threats of judgment on all those who defy and disbelieve and disobey him. Now listen to me now. Don't miss this. Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 and 13 says this. Now listen to me. It says, work out your own salvation. Not work for it. Work out your own salvation. How do I do it, Lord? With fear, phobos, and trembling. With reverence in what? Now, beloved, that sound like one saved, always safe to you? For it is God that worketh in you, both to will and do of his good pleasure. And God works in you, both to will, motivating you to will and empowering you to do his pleasure. You see, it's of God, isn't it? But God says you work out your salvation, not with just casually walking around, oh, everything's lovely, whatever, and I can do whatever I want. God says, I want you to walk circumspectly. I want you to walk mindful of me. Know the terror of the Lord is what he's saying. That's pretty profound, isn't it? And Paul had to preach to the church at Corinth, because if you read the Corinthian epistles, beloved, Every chapter is correcting how sinful they were. And Paul said, how do you want me to come? I've got apostolic power. You want me to come in love or do you want me to come with a rod? You want me to use it to blind some of you? You want me to use it to judge some of you? You want me to use my apostolic power in a negative way? That's what Paul was saying to them, beloved. Now, you don't hear many preachers saying that today because we want to build the church. Well, guess what? Christ builds the church. All right? I just want to be faithful to God. So, beloved, what I'm saying is, sadly, some Corinthians had now lost their fear of God. 
like a lot of Christians do today. Some Christians have thought that they were going to escape the judgment of God. My question to you, beloved, is how many of you really have a healthy fear of God? Or you just kind of been lulled to sleep in your walk with the Lord? Beloved, why did they lose their fear of God? Because in their moral and spiritual deception, and in their moral and spiritual complacency, and in their moral and spiritual ignorance, they believe that they now that they were saved and they were under grace, they could never again be judged for their sins. And that is not true. If it's under the blood. Amen? Not living in sin, it must be where? Under the blood. So that's important that you understand a little bit of that, beloved. Remember, this is just basic 101 Christianity that I'm teaching you right now. So Paul uh, wants us to know that, sure, we've been forgiven for our past sins, but now that we're saved and sanctified, we're expected and enabled by God to live holy, righteous, and godly lives in obedience to His commandments and strive not to sin. And that's why 1 John 1, 7 exhorts us to walk in the light. It says, if you walk in the light. Notice, if on the condition that you do. If you walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of His Son cleanseth us from all sin. In other words, as I'm walking in the light of the truth of His word, will, and ways, the moral and spiritual truth, and I'm walking along, I'm convicted, I'm forgiven, I'm asking God to forgive me. What's He doing with me all the time? He's washing me. He's keeping me justified. He's keeping me sanctified. He's keeping me clean. He's keeping me washed. But I must do what? I must what? Walk away from the light or walk in the light? Should I go into the shadows and walk? No. Should I go into the darkness and walk? No. I must make a decision that what I'm going to do is I am going to now, by His grace, by His Spirit, I will walk in the light. Walk in the light. Walk in the light. Know the terror of the Lord. Would you say amen out there? Hear me now. We're not to walk in the light of our own feelings. A lot of people do it. We're not to walk in the light of our own emotions or thoughts because Jeremiah 17, 9 and 10 says the heart is the soul above all things and it's desperately wicked. Who can know it? Your heart will tell you whatever you want. You can live as filthy as a barnyard dog and your heart will say, well, you accepted Jesus, so therefore you think about him every now and then, you're all right. Is that what the Word says? I'm supposed to measure my, my convictions according to what I feel or what I think? According to what God wrote down. See, beloved, this is the mirror the Bible talks about. The mirror doesn't lie. You can have a pimple on the end of your nose, and you can bang your head on the mirror, but the pimple's still there. It's going to show that pimple until you do something with it. You must do something with it. Amen? You must do the will of God. So Paul reminds them here, and he reminds us here, beloved, of the terror of the Lord in light of the fact in verse 10 that there is a great day of judgment coming in which we shall all stand before the great tribunal of God. Oh, let me ask you, do you fear the Lord, beloved? Do you ever really think about whew, the terror of the Lord? Boy, I do. I, you know, I go through the Old Testament all the time, beloved, and I read it, and I see what God did to the nations that surrounded them. I see what God did to Israel when they fell into those sins, and he had delivered them out of Egypt. He had walked among them, and yet he uproot them, put them into captivity, killed them, slayed them, all kinds of things. And God says these things are written for our example, for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world have come. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 6 and 11, if you read it. So I'm not blowing smoke at you, am I? I'm trying to tell you, the choir sings about bringing you back to the moral basics. What am, what's Pastor Joel trying to do to you? I'm trying to bring you back there. You see, beloved... Then Paul goes on, he says, knowing this, knowing that there's going to be, knowing this sobering truth, that there's going to be a day of judgment, a day of reckoning coming. He says, we pytho men. The word pytho there, persuade. We persuade men. It is we constantly and continuously try to warn men. We try to constantly and continuously exhort men and encourage and convince people to do what, Paul? To get right with God. To do what, Paul? To turn to God and stay with God. To do what, Paul? 
to now walk holy with him and live for him before it's too late and you can't do it. Paul says we persuade men. We're trying to persuade you. And Paul had spent 18 months there. Can you imagine, beloved, how would you like to have Paul sit amongst you? Any question you had? You see, beloved, the Bible teaches that the only type of faith that saves is a living faith and a loving and a lasting faith, one that trusts Jesus Christ enough to make a commitment to him, a commitment of dedication and devotion that you're going to follow him, you're going to submit to him, you're going to surrender to him, and you're not just going to make a half-hearted commitment because you just want fire insurance. I want to go to heaven. I don't want to go to hell. But I don't want to leave the world of the kingdom of darkness. But I still want to go to heaven. That's a half-hearted commitment. You need a few weeks in the koa to have an attitude adjustment. <laughs> okay. My drone stock, you see, they're all hay shakers, the southerners. My beloved koa. <laughs> you what? <laughs> beloved koa. <laughs> What's that? Co op? No. <laughs> if I ever did that, they'd have killed me. Now, beloved, I have to admit to you, I must confess that I stand utterly amazed because I've been saved for a long enough time and I see what's happening. I stand utterly utterly amazed at the depth of spiritual and scriptural ignorance of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ today regarding all this and it's evidenced by the non-commitment of so many Christians, the disobedience of so many Christians, the faithfulness of so many Christians, and yet they say I'm still going to heaven. I stand utterly amazed at that. How about you? If you're reading the Word of God, beloved. You see, many today, they live just like the world, just like some in the church at Corinth, and they claim to be spiritual and possess all of the gifts. My wife and I watched this guy last night, and I won't mention any names, and he was talking about all the angels he saw come toward him and, uh, and uh, how he's spoken with Jesus and all this. And I said to Ellie, everything he said, everything he said contradicts God's word. Now, he mentioned Jesus. But, beloved, I've got to tell you this. He's got more of a chance of meeting the real God than ever meeting the one that he, he said, okay? It is unbelievable. And people are saying, amen, hallelujah, glory to God. How ignorant can you be? How much more can a preacher stand up before you and you won't measure what he says according to the word of God? We don't measure ourselves by ourselves. We don't compare ourselves among ourselves. That's foolishness to do that, Paul said. We measure ourselves according to the word of God. Would you say amen out there? You see, beloved... They have no fear of the Lord before their eyes. They don't know the terror of the Lord. And so therefore, they don't know the most basic biblical truths, especially about soteriology. You say, Pastor Joel, what is soteriology? I have to put my glasses close to this because when I spit, it goes all over them. It is the doctrine of salvation that they should have known from the get-go. I'm going to spend the rest of my sermon on that. How about that? You ready? Hold on. I want you to follow along as I teach you here this morning, beloved, because I want you to hear what I have to say. A lot of folks don't have a clue of what it really means to be saved by grace through the blood of the resurrected Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, and His finished work on the cross. They don't have a clue of what it really means to walk in the Spirit and be led of the Spirit, so you do not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. Do you hear that? I can still fulfill the lusts of the flesh, but I won't do it if I'm led of the Spirit or what? Walk in the Spirit. So there's an option there. I must make a choice. You see, beloved, don't you miss this now. I want you to hear this. They have no clue of what it really means to now have, a, or have to live a holy, righteous, and godly life. You're not in the kingdom of darkness anymore. Now you're in the kingdom of God. Now you're in the kingdom of life. Come on and say amen out there. You see, you're in the kingdom of light right now. They have no idea what it means. Not a clue. Not a clue what it means to have to obey the commandments of God. Can you imagine anything? If you don't obey the commandments at work or your rules at work, are they going to keep you there? Oh, you don't obey the commandments or the rules of the football team. You're going to stay on that? But yet people think, I can come to God and do whatever I want to do, and I'm still going to go to glory. I'm still going to do it. And that's not true. 
That's just not, and beloved, I say that with love, believe me, in my heart, because I want to save as many people as I can. I want to preach to them the truth of the Word of God. You don't hear the Word of God being proclaimed much anymore. People have watered it down as spiritual pablum, telling people what they want to hear and don't need to hear. And someday they'll regret it. They may have all the things they want in this life, but someday they'll regret it. You see, they have no idea, not a clue, not a clue what it means to have to preserve, persevere in the faith and fight in the spiritual battle. Oh, beloved, I told you when God changed my message, I went home last week and I said, I got the message you want, Lord. Praise the Lord. I said, I can kind of coast this week. And God said, you're not going to preach it, Joel. This is what I want you to preach. I said, oh, God, oh, I, honest, beloved, I feel so inadequate to do it. There's so much to it. I feel so inadequate, and I don't want to preach it. And I knew it was of God. Why? Because the Spirit of God gave it to me. And Satan attacked me all week. My eczema acted up. That's why I got a little stash today. I can't see it. It gets all irritated. My back's like... And, and when that happens, I've been saved long enough and a preacher long enough that that's the devil himself. I told my wife, I said, Ellie, pray for me. Satan himself has got his hand on this preacher. He does not want to hear the word of the Lord because many souls are affixed to this truth. Especially all those folks that are watching by television and write me. So, beloved, few, they don't have a clue. They don't know the difference between what the Bible means when it speaks of works of merit to earn your salvation, which are excluded from the gospel, or works of faith, uh, which are included in the gospel, and they are necessary acts to be able to cross the finish line and enter into the kingdom of God. Amen? Now, there's a vast difference between those two. You folks who have gone to seminary, you know that's true. You folks who read the Bible, you know that's true beloved now you may put it out of your mind but the fact of the matter is that's true amen you hear me now sadly many people today see God's grace as a license to sin or do their own thing they do not see grace beloved as God's divine means to now conquer and be victorious over sin grace to them means that they can still live in sin do what they want to go do and still go to heaven. Beloved, that's a fool's hope. Do you even remotely think? Nobody likes to have fun more than I do. You know that. I, I like to cut up. I like to do a lot of things. But when I get this Christianity, I'm as serious as a heart attack. Because I know, I know, beloved, I've seen a lot of things over the years. I've seen preachers, preachers come and go. I've seen them fall by the wayside. I've seen Christians who have kind of uh, lollygagged and said, thinking they're still going to heaven, yet contradicting everything the Word of God says. And my soul breaks for them. Now, beloved, like this believe, uh, folks who believe like this, I should say, they do not know the scriptures. You see, they fail to see that living in overt or premeditated and presumptuous sins of the flesh, not only like fornication or adultery or homosexuality or drunkenness or drugs, but, beloved, living in unfaithfulness to God and disobedience to God's commandments is still sin. It is a gross violation of God's law. 1 John 3, 4 says sin is, not was, Sin is, and he's speaking to Christians, the transgressions of God's law. Sin is the transgression of God. He hates sin. Jesus had to die. If there was any other way he could have saved us. But we're going to live in sin? Is that what we should do? You see, beloved, impenitent sin. Not that the has been put under the blood. Impenitent sin is still punishable by death. Now let me tell you exactly the phrase the Bible is used. It is trampling underfoot the blood of the cross and of the covenant whereby you were sanctified. It is taking Christ's blood that's forgiven you, that promises you all of these great and uh, precious, exceeding promises in Christ, and saying, I don't care what he says. I want to go to heaven, but I still want to do my own thing down here. I got my life to live. And it's going like this with his blood. It's trampling his foot. Because Christ didn't come down to save us from that. See, that's what the unsaved world does. Reach all the gusto you can. I've taught you before, but I'm not going to go there. But when you trample on the foot of the blood of the Christ, beloved, what you're doing is doing despite unto the Spirit of grace. That means insulting the Holy Spirit. It means you're grieving and quenching the voice of the Holy Spirit, beloved. And those who do that will not be saved unless they repent, and they better do it now while they can. Or they'll never get into heaven. And beloved, that's why the church has been so persecuted. Through the, that's why they crucified Christ, because he taught like I'm teaching you right now. Not because he worked miracles or healed people. You see, beloved, they're like blind, the blind Corinthians. That's what Paul was rebuking them for. 
who have forgotten about the cross of Christ. They forgot about the blood. They forgot about the day of judgment that's coming. They forgot about the terror of the Lord, beloved. And they ignored Christ. And they ignored His teaching that they needed to deny themselves and pick up their cross and follow Him. You see, beloved, we still have a cross when we get saved, don't we? We lay down the yoke of this world, the yoke of sin, but now we have to pick up the cross. And we start following Him. And it's not easy. But eternal life, God says, is worth all of it. Now, either you believe it or you don't. If you don't believe it like that, then, you're going to, then what you think, beloved, is that you're just going to be able to do whatever you want to do and go to heaven. But I'm telling you, someone who loves you, someone who's trying to teach you, that that's not true. And nobody in this room can show me from the Word of God that that's true. I've challenged many people, and you know that, beloved. Now, what are you saying, Pastor? I'm saying what they're doing is sure their duty as a Christian. They want to go to heaven. They want to go into the kingdom. They want the blessings, but they don't want the burden. Am I right? They don't want the self-denial. They don't want to have to die to sin, self, Satan, this evil world system. They don't want to do that. I am going to do my own thing. I'm my king. I'm my own Lord. And that's not true. So why is this happening, Pastor? Because many today have been so weaned on the deadly and the dangerous doctrine of the heretical doctrine of the once saved, always saved, beloved, and it's removed all fear of the danger and deadliness of sin, and now they have no fear of God before their eyes. If you knew that I was 10 feet tall and big muscular, and I could stomp you, you'd have some fear of me, wouldn't you? Now, if you're on my good side, you say, well, I, I kind of respect the guy who would have my bad side. You're afraid I'm going to whoop you. Right? Well, that's what that fear, the phobos that I've been telling you about in the Greek, that's what it means. One side's reverence and respect for God. The other one's fear and shaking and quaking. Where do you know your own salvation? How am I doing it? Tell me. Tell me, saints. With fear and trembling. That's what that word means. Oh, erase that from the script. <laughs> you see, beloved, why is this happening? Because many today have been so weaned on the deadly and dangerous diet of the lopsided preaching just about the love of God or the mercy of God or the grace of God to the total exclusion and omission of His holiness and righteousness as judgment, beloved, and they have no fear of God before their eyes. And yet the Bible teaches that God's love and God's mercy and God's grace will never, ever do what His holiness and His justice and His righteousness condemns. That's why Jesus had to die. God couldn't remove that law. It's a, a sacred transcript of His own character and nature. God can't change it. God's saying, if I was down there, I'd have no other gods before me. First commandment. If I was down there, I would not make unto me any graven image. Second commandment. I would not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Third commandment. Remember the Sabbath day, keep it holy. Fourth. Well, you know, beloved, I don't have to quote it for you. Why is this happening, preacher? I'll tell you why, beloved. Because many today have been so weaned on the deadly diet of this ultra-gracism. That is misunderstanding grace that to them means that all your sins are covered, even if you don't repent of them. Have you heard that? Beloved, listen to me. Let me appeal to what you know a little bit. 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, if on the condition that we confess our sins, He, God, is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's great, isn't it? The word confess there means if I admit it, if I repent of it, and if I forsake it. But what if I don't? Does He still cleanse me? Huh? People are saying, oh, don't worry about that. I can still do my own thing and I'm okay. Is that true? Does that contradict the Word of God? I ask you this morning. You see, beloved, I've got nothing to gain, everything to lose. But I'm going to stand before God and I said, Lord, I didn't fear man or anyone. The fear of man is a snare. But whoso trusteth in the Lord shall be blessed. You see, beloved, most don't even know that the Bible clearly teaches this. Now listen, I'm not going to give you all the scriptures I was going to, but you know this is true. Just look it up. The Bible teaches that a Christian can fail of the grace of God, that a Christian can frustrate the grace of God, that a Christian can receive the grace of God. Look at chapter 6, verse 1, just right here. Paul says, We then, as workers together, that's apostles, together with him, beseech you Corinthians also. Were they saved? Were they Christians? that you receive not the grace of God in vain. Can a Christian receive the grace of God in vain? Yes, they can, beloved. A lot of people don't know that the Bible says that a Christian can turn the grace of God into lasciviousness, 
that they can continue or discontinue in, the gra in grace, that they can grow in grace in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, 2 Peter 3.18, or they can groan in disgrace. And Peter ends that text, by the way, by saying, for if you do these things, you shall never fall, that is, from grace. Because that's ultimately what the Bible says in Galatians 5.4. A Christian can what? Fall from grace. Fall away from grace. And go back and do their own thing. No, I'm not trying to scare you this morning, but that's not my purpose. My purpose is to teach you the rudimentary thing. No matter what you do in life, you have to come back to the basics. Amen? All the ancillary things, beloved, are just the gravy. But you have to come back to the basics. All the time. No matter what it is. I don't care if you're a computer. I don't care if you're a... Uh, teacher, I, I don't care what it is that you are. You have to come back uh, to the basics. Now I want you to hear some things that Paul said. Paul says this to the church at Rome. In Romans 6, 1 and 2, he says, what? What shall we say then that we're under grace? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid! How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Now, beloved, he goes on and he says this, because he's us here that we can still sin in spite of the grace of God, amen, depending on upon how we're going to use it. Paul goes on to the church at Rome and he says in Romans chapter 6 verses 15 and 16, he says, what then? He says, shall we sin because we are not under the law but under grace? God forbid. Know ye not that so many, I mean, that to whom you yield yourself servants to obey, his servants you are to whom you obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. In other words, the more I keep yielding, the God, He keeps doing what to me? He keeps pulling me in, pulling me in. But if I keep yielding unto unrighteousness, death is doing what to me? It's pulling me the other way. So God says, make a decision. Who is on the Lord's side, Moses said. Who is on the Lord's side, Elijah said. Who is it? Declare your position. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom the Lord hath redeemed from the hand of his enemy. The Bible teaches, amen. You say, Pastor Joel, I'm going to kill you. Don't you kill me. Wait in line. I'm not through yet. I want you to really have a reason to kill me. You see, beloved, because he goes on to say to that church in Romans 6, 23, know you not the wages of sin is what? Death? Is he speaking to the unsaved? The wages of sin. It's going to pay something in the end. It's death. Oh, beloved, you hear me now. You can't help but read the Psalms and see this truth over and over again. For example, in Psalm 97, 10, the Bible says, Ye that love the Lord hate evil. And I can't even watch the news. And I, I get so fired up, beloved, because when I look and I see the injustice and the people that are, I can't even tell you what it does. And the lying from the politicians, I don't trust any of those. I, I had my dealings with the CIA when I was in the Marine Corps, and I, I don't trust any of those. They came to my house, they said, where's Ellie? I said, right over there. No. I said, Who? Ellie, I never heard of her. <laughs> How do you think the lying, cheating, feeling? <laughs> Anyways, but what am I saying to you? I'm saying this. Grace does not permit us to live in sin, beloved. Grace does not forgive unconfessed sin. That's why he says, if we confess our sins. Amen? So these are basic truths. How do Christians miss this? I'll tell you why. They don't read their Bibles. I'll tell you why. They don't come to church. I'll tell you why, they're not being taught. Isn't that true? We're resting in Zion. We're putting our feet up. Well, now that I get baptized, let's kind of drift into the kingdom. That's not true. You just entered the race. You hear me now? You just entered the spiritual battle. And this race isn't a sprint. I wish it was. I used to love the sprint. It's a marathon. Right? I've been in the body of Christ 45 years now, and I'm still... So the grace of God, trying to run. Still trying to run to that finish line. Now, beloved, let me... I have to go into another section right here in the last 48 minutes that I have. <laughs> the Bible teaches this, that even though God's grace is free, it is not without divine conditions. Did you hear that? God's has unconditional love to all of mankind, but he doesn't have unconditional salvation to all mankind. There's some things that God's grace expects you to do if you ever want to be saved. For example, a familiar passage of Scripture, beloved, all ultra-gracists who want to deny what I'm saying right now will quote. They'll say this. 
Doesn't Ephesians 2, 8 through 10 say, For by grace I be saved through faith and not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, as any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in him. Doesn't the Bible say that? Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. It does. It do. It do say that. But beloved, listen to me. I want you to notice there in that text, God's divine sovereignty working in conjunction with man's human response and responsibility to be saved. In other words, the gift of salvation is by grace through faith. What do you mean, preacher? God's grace freely saves. That's God's part, isn't it? But only those who through faith place their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and keep their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's man's part. Salvation is by what? Grace, God's part, through faith, man's part. Is it a dead faith? Is it a dying faith? Or is it a living, active, obedient faith? You tell me now. I want you to tell me. I want you to preach to me. I'm not going to teach you. You know that. I am. So, beloved, what am I saying to you? I'm saying, thus to receive God's grace of salvation, then man must first meet God's condition of faith and trust Christ as his Lord and Savior now to be saved by his grace. If there's no faith response from man, then there's no great response of God to man. Amen? Now, I try to break this down. I was going to use all kinds of theological terms, and I said, Lord, I'll be explaining this in the next 10 years. So bear with me in my folly here, beloved, as I kind of follow along my notes, because I wanted to preach it off the cuff. The grace of God, oh, hush. I just ran out of time. You want me to keep going? Okay. You get your lunch? The grace of God, now beloved, listen to me, I want you to study the scriptures, is governed, it is regulated, it is dispensed by the divine conditions. conditions. He has affixed to it in his word for man to be saved and sanctified from his first till his final salvation, beloved, until he enters into the eternal kingdom of God. Now listen, I got saved, right? The Bible says, I'm pressing on the upward way, new heights I'm gaining every day, still praying as I'm onward bound, Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. Paul says, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. I agonize for it. I'm pressing. I'm fighting. I'm doing all I can to what? I'm pressing. <clears throat> Paul says, I was pressed out of measure. It's a, not, it's a, a, a term from horticulture when you take grapes and... and, and um, Olives, and you press them, and you get the oil out of it. That's cold press, by the way. No solvents at it. <laughs> but uh, the, the point I'm getting at, beloved, is this. Let me illustrate what I'm saying. Grace, for example, here's the condition. Does grace say to be saved, a man must repent? When a man repents, is he earning his son? Is that a work of merit or a work of faith? Grace says you must confess your sins. The Bible says that grace says you must Obey, you must follow, you must abide, you must continue in the faith, you must endure in the faith, you must persevere in the faith, you must overcome in the faith, you must die and deny in the faith, and you must be faithful and fruitful in the faith. And beloved, these are not works of merit whereby you earn your salvation, which are excluded from the gospel, because no man can ever possibly earn eternal life. It's impossible. No matter all the gold in the world you had, couldn't buy you all that. So it's impossible for you and I to earn our salvation, but words of faith is going to test the genuineness of your faith. You hear me now? I, all my life, I, you folks have gone to school, whether it's college, seminary, you know you have to be tested, right? You, Cheryl, you're getting one coming up. The fourth. I don't want you to have a fifth on the fourth, okay? But, but beloved, you know what I'm talking about here. And that's what God does. God is watching our faith all of the time, beloved. Works of faith are included in the gospel. Why? They're expected because they're the necessary faith response to now receive and appropriate the grace of God so its supernatural presence and power can be unleashed in your life so God can save you, so God can bless you. See, He is the Savior, amen? Not us. He's the Savior. And we can't spurn the means whereby he's going to save us. That would be like you drowning and God throwing you a life preserver. And you say, well, I don't want it. I'm going to swim myself. Well, I believe that's a life preserver. I believe that someone's thrown it to me, but I'm not going to hold on to it. 
You see what I'm saying, ladies and gentlemen? These are not works of merit. These are works of faith. And so we can't receive God's uh, grace or his divine unmerited favor or ever please him, beloved, unless we have these works of faith. Now listen, Hebrews 11, 6, another scripture. It says, um, without faith, it's impossible to please God. For he that cometh, notice the verb, he that what? Cometh. I'm, I'm moving ahead. I'm moving ahead now. He that cometh to God must believe that he is, that he exists. And he's a rewarder of them that do what? Diligently seek him. Who does God reward? Those who diligently seek him. So in order for me to please God, I have to have a living faith. I have to have a diligent faith. I have to have a what? Seeking faith. Do you have that? I hope you do. I hope you folks watching my television. That's why I'm preaching it. Because people have forgotten the very basics of the gospel itself, beloved. You see, man's faith must constantly and continuously receive and utilize and appropriate and cooperate with the grace of God, beloved, so he can be saved from his initial salvation or the first to his final salvation. In other words, God throws me the life preserver, and I'm holding on to it. There's the grace, right? And God's going, hold on, Joel. I am, lo- <laughs> ain't much left in me, but I'm holding on. Right? Isn't that what God's saying? So I'm cooperating with the grace of God. I'm not spurning the grace of God. I'm not saying I'm going to do my own thing. I've got my own way of doing it. Beloved, you can do it. I love you no matter what you do. You know that. But if I'm going to be your pastor and you want to get into heaven, hear what I'm saying to you. Check me out. That's all I can say to you. Now, I've got a little bit more I want to give you, Beloved. The only way you're going to get saved and stay saved is to cooperate with your own free will. You are a free moral agent before God. Now listen to me. I don't want you to miss this truth. This is a basic truth. God does not save you against your will, right? Nor does he keep you saved against your will. God does not force you to get saved, nor force you to stay saved. And a lot of people miss that. How come, Pastor Joel? Well, let me just kind of give it to you in a nutshell, beloved. Because they fail to realize that after we get saved, we do not lose our free will and start walking around like mindless robots or automatons who automatically and mechanically just do what we're told like this. That's not true. God says, okay, you came to me. I'm glad you came to me. I called you. I called you by my spirit and grace through the gospel with a high calling, with a heavenly calling, with a holy calling, the Bible says. You know what it say? I called you and I'm still calling you. I'm beckoning you. Come unto me. Come unto me, all ye that labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and lure to me, for I am meek and lonely of heart. For you shall find find rest for your souls. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. But it's still a yoke, isn't it? Oh, the yoke of sin is heavy. I w- if I found out tomorrow, if I found out tomorrow everything was a lie, the gospel wasn't true, I'd still be a Christian because I've never had more joy and peace in my soul. Wouldn't you? It's a superior way of life. You, you rise above the din of this world. So what am I saying to you, beloved? Let me just kind of give it to you in a nutshell. The Bible says this about our faith, because a lot of Christians make shipwreck of their faith. They start off well, and then all of a sudden they get a hole in the stern or the, or, or the uh, bow, that's, <laughs> oh, hush. <laughs> you got a hole there, right, or, or in the beam, <laughs> and the boat starts filling with water, and now all of a sudden that hull's about three feet down in the water, and they're kind of straight to the water. See, so they're back out into the world, they're doing their own thing, just kind of, and they're wondering, how come, I'm, how come everything's going wrong? How come I'm in the... And God's trying to do, come on to me. I'm trying to chasten you so you'll wake up. I'm putting people in your path. I'm speaking to you. I got a preacher preaching to you. And that's how God says he saves the world through the foolishness of what? Seminary professors? No. Educators? No. How does God save the world? Through preachers. Not because we're anything special. It's the message, beloved. So many have stopped preaching the message. And we're at ease in Zion. And the Bible says, and that's why I should say the Bible says, our faith is more precious than gold that perishes. The Bible say that? 
Beloved, the Bible says that our faith must be constantly and continuously tried and tested. Now listen to me. In the fiery furnace of affliction to purify it and to perfect it, to get all of the dross out so God can see the metal of your faith. Is it true? Sure, they hung on to me at the beginning. They didn't want to go to hell. Somebody told me they're going to go to hell, so they want to hang on. But now they don't want to live for me. They don't want to follow me. They don't want to obey me. They don't want to do any of this. Isn't that what's happening in Christendom today? People think you can have Jesus in the world too, beloved. If there was that, I still have my rock and roll band if that were true. And I love music. I can just sing around me. <laughs> you want me to sing to you? That'd be a dollar laid outside. You see, beloved, that's why the Bible says our faith in the person and passion of the Lord Jesus Christ and His precepts, beloved. And in His spirit and grace is the victory that overcomes the world. Our faith is the divine means, the vehicle, the instrument whereby God has said in His redemptive plan, I have designed it this way, I have designated it this way, that I will save them by my grace, and through faith, holding on, I'm going to pull them in. Now, God made it that way. I didn't. Faith must be alive. It must be active. It must be living. Because God says then, you hold on to me and I'll through all my supernatural and divine power and promises and blessings in Christ, I'm going to save and sanctify your soul. Amen. Now, beloved, let me just go through this quickly. God gives us the supernatural power to believe. He gives us the supernatural grace to believe. He gives us the supernatural ability to believe, the supernatural opportunity to believe. The sup- he, God does it all for us. But what God does not do is he does not obey for us. He does not believe for us. He does not repent for us. He gives us the opportunity to do it. He gives us the power to do it. He gives us the grace to do it. But I must, through faith, say, okay, Lord, your will, not mine, be done. Am I right? Is is that not what the Scripture teaches? Then how do so many Christians forget that? What apostasy the Church of Christ is in right now. And beloved, there's good godly men throughout the country Little small pockets are still keeping the truth fertile because the gates of hell won't prevail against Christ's church. That's why we're still here, by the way. You see, beloved, what am I saying to you? I'm saying it's not enough to say, I believe you, Lord, without obedience. It's not enough to say, Lord, uh, I, I, I don't want to go to hell, uh, but God says, do you want to be faithful? Right? You see, beloved, it's not enough to say all of these things before the Lord without faithfulness and pursuit of God. Because that's what God expects through faith. And he's given us all the means to do it. Oh, I have so much I want to teach you, beloved, but I just for brevity of time, I won't. Let me just kind of wrap this up. God's grace has provided for us all of the supernatural resources and power that we need to be saved, right? He provided the life preserver, the boat, the water, <laughs> the power, the, all of that. And he expects me through faith to do what with that life preserver? To grab it and hold on to it once or continually till I get in the boat. Am I in the boat yet? No, I'm in the spiritual kingdom of God right now, but I have not yet entered into that eternal life in the eternal kingdom of God. That's the battle. You see, that scope, that's where the battle goes on. That's where the race is. Paul says that we must endure unto the end so we can get that crown. Amen? He that endureth to the end, Jesus said, shall be saved. I wonder how many will endure to the end. They'll endure on what the world's teaching the church right now. You can have the, everything that you want in the world to boot, and then you still go to the heaven. But that's not what God says, right? You see, beloved, God has provided it all. That's why Jonah 2 9 says, Salvation is of the Lord from start to finish. He's the captain of our salvation, He's the author and finisher of our faith, He's the Lord and Savior of the world. God has provided it all. But He says, How much do you really love me? You love me enough to obey me? You love me enough to follow me? Well, I love you, Lord. You do. You do love me. But how come you don't obey what I tell you to do? How come you don't follow me? How come you don't submit and surrender? How come you don't come to church? How come you don't read your Bible? How come you don't pray all the time? But you love me? What do you love about me? That you're not going to go to hell? 
And if you don't love the kingdom now, why would you ever want to go to heaven? Because you're going to have to give up all of the things that you're holding on to down here. Beloved, what am I saying to you? I'm saying if we hold on to Christ through grace, beloved, by, I mean through faith, then he will indeed save and sanctify us, won't he? He'll supernaturally enable and empower us to overcome this whole evil world, so this whole battle, beloved. He'll make us more than conquerors, and he'll grant us immortality and eternal life in the kingdom of God, and he'll lead us into everlasting glory. But we should have the terror of the Lord if we neglect our salvation. Now, I've got to quote you another scripture. In Hebrews 2.3, the Bible says this, How shall we escape? if we neglect so great salvation. He didn't say reject. What did he say? Neglect. Now listen to me. I have a garden. Not right now. <laughs> it's too hard. You know I have to weed it, water it, pull it up, shake it up, you know, do all the kinds of things I have to do. If I neglect that garden within a minute, or a minute, within a week, that thing's overgrown with weeds. God says, you let your salvation, the garden of your salvation overcome with weeds, you're going to neglect it? Not reject it. What do you do to it? You got it, but now you're starting to neglect it. Oh, I got this to do in front of it. I got that to do, and I got this to do, and I got that to do. But you know, Lord, I still love you, but you know, I got this to do. God says, how come you're not dying to yourself? How come you're not denying yourself? Is that true, ladies and gentlemen? I want to ask you, you who have read the scriptures, does the Bible teach that over and over again? You see, beloved, our security is only in Christ. It is not in our sin. It is not in ourself, and it's certainly not in our feelings. 1 Corinthians 10, 12 says to folks like that, Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. Notice the warning. God says, you who think by your feelings, well, I feel saved. Does that mean anything? Before I got saved, I was a Catholic. I was a religious Catholic, but I was as lost as a dog in the woods. From here up, I knew the right things, but from here down, I wasn't living it. I wasn't in there. I didn't have a regenerated heart yet. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. Beloved, I've taught you, we are only eternally secure when we're secure in eternity. Until then, we've got to fight the good fight of faith, beloved. We must have, fear the terror of the Lord. The Bible says we must lay hold of eternal life. We must persevere unto the end. The Bible says daily we must sur surrender to the Lordship of Christ. Uh, the, the, listen, beloved. The, the Bible says to us we must live in obedience to commandments and do the will of God. Jesus said this in Matthew 21 through 23. He says, In that day many will say unto me, Lord, Lord, I want to enter into your heaven. God says, not all that say that are going to enter into my heaven. But he that does the will of God. For many will say unto me that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? Have we not done many wonderful miracles in your name? Have we not delivered many demons in your name? And then God will go like this. He says, depart from me, ye that work iniquity. I never knew you. Iniquity is sinning against light. They knew God's will. They knew about God's power, but what did they keep doing? Ignoring it. Ignoring it. My fear as a pastor, any pastor, is that people hear a sermon like this, and I'm not trying to scare you, I'm trying to teach you. And they'll leave the church and they say, Phew, pastor won't feel about me. But love you don't worry about me. I love you anyway, but I'm not your judge. If you're in the deepest sin, and a lot of you have been, have I been there? Say amen if I haven't. I said, if I haven't. <laughs> I've tried to be there for you. I've gone to jail with you. I'm, I'm looking at. Beloved, the Bible says this. Listen to me. We have to be faithful unto death to receive the crown of life. Isn't that what the Bible said to the church of Sardis? faithful even if you have to get martyred, Joel. I know you'll be afraid, but I'll give you the dying grace and I will be afraid, just like you will. Now that's the kind of faith that saves. 
because we understand a little bit about the terror of the Lord. Jesus did on the cross when he dipped his own soul in the hell and suffered the torments of the Dan because he says, I can't absolve my law. I can't erase it. But I'll forgive people from it through my blood. I'll obey it perfectly for them. And if they come to me, I'll wash their sins away. I'll give them power. I'll give them strength. I'll keep changing their life. They'll go from one degree of faith to another degree of faith, one degree of glory to another degree of glory. But you can't say to me, oh, Lord, I love you. But you don't want to obey me. You can't say, oh, Lord, I love you, but I'm not going to tithe. Now, I don't care if you tithe or not. Tithe is 10% of the gross income. I've done it since the day I was saved. 45 years. How about you? Amen? God Has God blessed us here because of that? Has God blessed many churches because of that? Has God always blessed the church because of that? You say, well, I can't afford to tithe. I'm on Social Security. I'm on SSI. You can't afford not to tithe because God supernaturally gets involved in the 90% and stretches it a lot more than your 100%. He makes it 120%. I told you, I'll never forget when I first got saved, beloved, when I first got into the ministry, excuse me, I got ordained. I, I had, uh, when I had my health food stores, I had met this Armenian kid, and I liked him a lot. He was a nice, nice kid. And he says to me, he says, uh, my uncle gave me $70,000. I said, you got $70,000 in the kick? He says, yeah. And so he says, I want to start a health food store. I said, you don't want to get into health food stores. I mean, beloved, this is in 1970, 71. I mean, that was a novel. You didn't hear about health food stores. And my wife and I went through <clears throat> hell trying to teach people about things. But I said, get into the vitamin aspect of it. I'll help you design good vitamins and then put your own private label on it and start marketing vitamins. So we started doing it. And all of a sudden, the money started coming in. Nature most vitamins. You see it everywhere advertised, even on TV. Started coming in. His name was Bob Trigo. He was the one that was in charge of that. Well, I came home one day. I'd been, I'd been ordained three weeks. I was making $150 a week before tithing taxes. And I can remember going to my oil tank like this downstairs. Dear God in heaven, <laughs> you got to let this thing stretch. <laughs> I told you, it's been 45 years still stretching. <laughs> I wish, right? I come home from work and I see a mobile home parked in my yard. I said, oh Lord, what did Ellie do? And so Ellie's at the door of my house and she's got Kobe in her arms, this little baby. And she goes, said, okay. So I go over to the door, I knock on it. All of a sudden, shoo, the door opens up. I go up the steps. I look, there's this beautiful mobile home, decorative as anything, beloved. And there's Bob Tree with a, JB, hi. And he comes running up. He was a religious Catholic. And I used to witness to him all the time. I told you if I ever make it that I'm going to hire you to work as my representative for the Southeast Corridor down here. You don't have to go any farther than Vermont. You don't have to go any farther south than Rhode Island and all well, the whole nine yards. He says, and I'll start you off with 95000 a year, he says, plus bonus. I said, see if I get this straight. I'm making 6500 a year right now. He says, you want to talk to where the devil works. He says, but JB, you don't have to stop being a Christian. You can still be a Christian. I said, but I, still have, I have to stop being a pastor. Well, yeah. Well. <laughs> my, my flesh went like this. Okay. <laughs> What's Satan trying to do? He's trying to get me out of the ministry. But you see, beloved, I knew, I knew that there's nothing in this world more precious than my eternal life. And I even told my wife, I won't go to hell for you. I'll do everything else for you. I do now, Ellie. <laughs> I'm only, she does it for me. What am I saying to you, beloved? I'm going to end with this. I'm going to give you part two next week, and I'm going to exegete all that. I'm going to give you a nice outline next week, and I'm going to be on time. But I had to lay the foundation today. Paul says, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Paul said, if you read 1 Corinthians 9, 24 through 27, Paul said he feared, lest after I had preached to everyone, as a great apostle, I myself should be a what? A castaway. With all the apostolic privileges and power Paul had, he says, listen, I don't take anything for granted. And neither should we. I have never once in my life doubted my salvation, ever. I've always had that sweet witness of the Spirit of God in me. But you know, beloved, through the grace of God, I've never wanted to go back and do the things I used to do. 
When I, made it, when I finally turned to Christ, and I mean this with all my heart, beloved, because I finally had to give God. I, I wanted God under my terms. I said, Lord, come into my heart. I, I, I want you to my Savior. I came back from Vietnam, and I, I'd been wounded in the whole nine yards. And I said, come into my heart, Lord. I see man's inhumanity to man. And I didn't trust leaders. I didn't trust the CIA. I didn't trust any of them. They were a bunch of cheats. <laughs> They're very nice. I like them all. <laughs> I'm on tape. I forgot. But in the back of my mind, I belonged to a young American, it was called the Young America Club. You folks watching, I let the cat out of the bag. My grandfather started it when he came over from Portugal, my father, and then me. I was a third generation. All the guys I grew up with, all the guys I ran with, it was a good club. You, if you got drunk there, they took your keys from you. You couldn't drink it. They wouldn't let you drive home. If you got in a fight, you were thrown out for life. It was a good, as far as a nice, good family type of a club, it was good. But I'd say in my heart, I'm not going to leave it. And God will whisper to me, then you're not going to be saved. And I can't tell you the whole testimony because we don't have a long time right now, but it was not until the day that I finally said, after he dealt with me, and he did it supernaturally, by the way, I said, that's it, Lord, I'll give up whatever you want. Wham! For three weeks, I didn't know if my feet touched the ground. So what am I saying to you? I'll close with this. Know the terror of the Lord. God loves you. God wants to save you. But you must let him do it. And you must do it his way. Don't listen to this ultra racism today that says, now that you're saved, just wait for a pre-tribulation rapture to snatch you out of here. The Bible says, strive that you may enter in. Labor for the meat that endureth unto eternal life. Didn't the Bible say that? Press toward the mark for the prize of the high court. Where did this other stuff come up from? I'll tell you where it came up from. Man's mind, the tradition of men. Know the terror of the Lord. Father in heaven, bless the